Thank you, Gary. Beautiful, and welcome back. Gary's been suffering in Las Vegas for the last week, so it's glad to have you back from vacation. Welcome to all of you to our service this morning. It's great to be in God's house and worship uh, together. And we have Antonio with us to lead our music, and we welcome those of you who are joining us online. I'd like to begin by reading from Psalm 139. Lord, you've examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. Even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above me, I can't fathom it. You are the one who created my innermost parts. You knit me together while I was still in my mother's womb. I give thanks to you that I was marvelously set apart. Your works are wonderful. I know that very well. My bones weren't hidden from you when I was put, being put together in a secret place. When I was being woven together in the deep parts of the earth, your eyes saw my embryo, and on, my scroll, on your scroll every day was written that was being formed for me before any of them had yet happened. God, your plans are incomprehensible to me. Their total number is countless. If I tried to count them, they outnumber the grains of sand. If I came to the very end, I'd still be with you. As we give thanks for God's presence that's always with us through thick and thin, let us begin our worship and we sing together hymn number 529, How Firm a Foundation. as we pray our opening prayer. O oh Lord, you are the potter, we are the clay. Take our lives, O oh God, and remake us anew. Fit us for your purposes that we may be filled with living water. Fit us for your purposes 
that we may be wholly yours. Amen. Please be seated. And Antonio, if you will sit up, I don't see the pastor here, so we're going to jump right into the um, hymn, of, uh, hymn of prayer. So let us prepare our hearts for our time of prayer by singing hymn 415, Take Up Thy Cross. for time of prayer. There's many uh, concerns and joys we want to lift up. We've got many people listed on our prayer list. Please keep those in prayer. We've had several that have had surgeries recently in need of recovery and um, healing, or healing from falls and other injuries people have suffered recently. Uh, our flowers on the altar are in honor of Norman Connie Weir's anniversary, 67 years. Congratulations, Norman <laughs> Connie. Norm robbed the cable cradle. T Connie was 10 when they got married, so <laughs> happy anniversary, both of you. Um, we have also in our bulletin, you can see the next Sunday, we're uh, celebrating where both of our, we finished our uh, beach service today. With a, had a great service this morning. Attendance was good. Weather was great, and next Sunday we all come back together and get to see one another after uh, not see, having seen each other throughout the summer. So we'll be having next Sunday our Stronger Together with Christ Sunday. So pray for that. We'll be outdoors here at 10. So we'll have a cookout, our Blessing in the pack, Backpack, some games, cornhole for you adults, and some uh, kids' games. Uh, that's all next Sunday. Wear your Northside T-shirts, your red or blue T-shirts. It's going to be a very casual uh, time next Sunday. Um, we were supposed to have had, and we'll have a chance to meet Pastor Lewis in a, another Sunday, but beginning this evening, uh, we've been in conversation with the, uh, the church is called Church of Faith of Cape Cod, and Pastor Lewis was going to be here for a prayer dedication, but wasn't able to be with us uh, this morning. But this is a Haitian congregation. They've been meeting in his, uh, it started out as a, I forgot how many years ago he started, but as a home Bible study, just his family gathering around the breakfast table for Bible study and prayer. And then around the time the earthquake, big earthquake hit Haiti, I think it was around 2009, they started other Haitian families on the Cape, started coming to them, wanting to gather for worship and prayer and Bible study. So they had had gone to a meeting around his kitchen table, outgrew that, moved to his basement, and had gotten to where they were having like 35 or uh, to 50 people and gotten too big for his basement. So they've been looking for a location and 
uh, spoke with us a month or so ago, and we've been in conversation. And so uh, beginning tonight, they're going to start worshiping uh, starting at 5 o'clock. You're welcome to join them. I don't know if you'll understand the service. He preaches in Creole and French, so I didn't understand uh, his preaching. I listened to one of his sermons online and uh, couldn't understand a word of it. But it's, they've got several families, and we pray that we give thanks that we're able to be a part of this ministry, of this growing congregation, and reaching uh, Haitian families here on the Cape. So pray for their beginnings uh, with us uh, this afternoon. And also, we wanted to celebrate our, this summer. We've been, our mission project has been the Cape Cod Foster Closet, and we donated uh, $740, over $740, to support Cape Cod Foster Closet, and they're preparing uh, for to serve about 100 kids, provide school supplies at school kicks off next week. So we give thanks for that, our ability to support that ministry. So shall we prepare our hearts for prayer? And uh, our prayer will be focused on those who are, um, as we're at this Labor Day weekend, those who in the workforce. So let us pray this morning. Jesus, worker and carpenter from Nazareth, this Labor Day weekend, we give you thanks for your care, for the loving concern you have for all of us, as we heard in the Psalms. You know us intimately and the care that you have for workers all throughout the world and the conditions that they're in. We pray for good working conditions and for their health and well-being. We remember all men and women, young and old, of all races, all ethnic and language groups throughout the world, every nation of the world. We pray for them. We pray for their um, working conditions. We pray that they would have uh, a fruitful environment, to work in, and they, they would understand your presence uh, with them each day in their work, and that you would show them how they could use that work as a ministry to build up the community in which they're employed and to do justice for you around the world. So we pray for workers who face dangerous conditions or hazards in their work who may not have sufficient warning or protection. We pray that you would keep them safe, give them safe conditions. Lord, we pray uh, for those who face conflict of working and caring for children without adequate support. We thank you for our teachers, for child care workers, for all of those who work with children and the role that you've given them to be role models and to teach our children as they grow. We pray for all workers who cannot find work, for whom unemployment assistance is not available. We pray that you would care for their basic needs, for the stress and worry of not being able to provide for family and loved ones. We pray you would open doors for meaningful work for those who are not able to find jobs at this time. We pray for workers who are displaced by technical change or global pressures to relocate jobs. We pray for training opportunities to learn new skills if necessary. We pray for them with the stresses of dealing with job changes and all that that uh, means for their families and those they support. We pray for children whose childhoods have been cut short because they have been forced to work at early ages. Lord, we pray for their well-being. We pray for all who face difficulties, for those who are discriminated against in getting work or at their workplaces, for because of race or gender, ethnic group, physical disabilities, political or religious beliefs, or sexual orientation. We pray for those who, that all forms of discrimination would be removed. We pray for all workers who've been affected by labor disputes, who have been discriminated against as a result of their union activity because they've sought justice in their workplaces. We pray for all workers whose work is taken for granted, is unappreciated, or lacks meaning. Lord, we pray that they would know that they are appreciated, that we would take time to give thanks for those who's, uh, who we see, we pass by, uh, service workers, um, servers, those working in restaurants, others who are working in places that they may not um, see the appreciation that they deserve. Lord, we ask for your care, for your guidance, that they would know your 
presence through the times where, that, where jobs are going well and for those where they're struggling. Lord, we invite um, you into this time to uh, lift up those who are on our hearts, the many who are recovering from surgery, those who have had recent falls and other illness or injuries that uh, they need healing from. We pray that you would encourage them, that you would strengthen them, and provide the healing that they need. We pray for our students as they're preparing to go back to school, those who are leaving home for the first time. Strengthen them and comfort them as they um, move into a new transition in life. Jill. For those who are victims of flooding and, and wildfires. For those who will be traveling to Florida and other places as they prepare to head to their homes for the fall and, and winter for safe travel for them. Lord, we pray for the Church of Faith of Cape Cod, for Pastor Lewis, for the members of their church. We pray for its growth, for its well-being, for their ministry as they seek to reach the Haitian families here on the Cape and support them. We pray that you would guide us in the ways we can encourage and support this new congregation. All of these things we lift up to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare to give our gifts and offerings back to God, let us do so with grateful and generous hearts. No! 
not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Though thousands fall about you, near you it shall not come, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. For to his angels he's given a command to guard you in all of your ways. Upon their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand, in the palm of his hand. We join together in our prayer of dedication. Holy and righteous God, through your Son, you've called us to follow. The gifts we offer this day are only a small token of affirmation that we accept that call. If we embrace the full meaning of that call, we would give our whole being to the offering. In many cases, we've allowed ourselves to believe that a few dollars and an hour on Sunday is the cost of discipleship. Help us to stop fooling ourselves and consider the full cost of a discipleship that means something, that is capable of transforming the world. By your grace and with the help of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. The scripture reading for today is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 25 to 33. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Turning to them, he said, Whoever comes to me and doesn't hate father and mother, spouse and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, even one's own life, cannot be my disciple. Whoever doesn't carry their own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. If one of you wanted to build a tower, wouldn't you first sit down and calculate the cost to determine whether you have enough money to complete it? Otherwise, when you have laid the foundation but couldn't finish the tower, all who see it will begin to belittle you. They will say, Here's the person who began construction and couldn't complete it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down to consider whether his 10,000 soldiers could go up against the 20,000 coming against him? And if he didn't think he could win, he would send a representative to discuss terms of peace while his enemy was still a long way off. In the same way, none of you who are unwilling to give up all your possessions 
can be my disciples. The word of God. We're going to hold off on the song for a second because I see Pastor Lewis and his wife is here. So, Pastor Lewis, would you come forward? And, and your wife as well. Yes. Oh, and is that your son that's with you? Oh, well, he can come also. <laughs> Welcome this morning. Those of you who mentioned uh, the Church of Faith of Cape Cod, and this is Pastor Lewis. Admira, and what's your name? Jimmy. Okay, so well, let's welcome them this morning. <laughs> Pastor Lewis, would you like to share a bit, come to the microphone and share a little bit about your congregation, and then we want to have a prayer of dedication uh, for your church this morning. Welcome. You can stand up. Good morning, church. As Pastor just said, my name is Pastor Lewis. I originally from Haiti, but I have been on Cape Cod for 22 years, and I represent Haitian Christian Evangelical Church of the Faith. I know it's long, but just say Christian Church of Faith. Okay. It is a small congregation starting at my dining room table with my wife and my five kids. We were getting together every Wednesday, 5 o'clock doing Bible study. And then every Sunday afternoon, we leading family devotions, worship at the house. Until some friends, family, come to pay visit to our family, realize that every Wednesday we are busy. And every Sunday we are busy. Not having dinner, as you think, but having spiritual dinner. And that's how they start coming to share that special moment with us until my living room become overflow. And then now I had to get down in my basement where I remember one time we had 45 people in my basement. And I had to go to the town of Dennis to declare that to tell them. So we want to let them know every Wednesday our neighborhood going to be occupied with many cars. So that's what happened from then. We've been worship and praise God at my house. Sometime we have some special moment. We rent hotel place to celebrate family and special occasions for that group until this group said, Pastor Luis, we would love someday to have a place to worship. Many of them used to go to some church in the area, but there was a problem. The Bible said the faith came by what you hear and then what you hear from the word of God. And then they, when they just come to Cape Cod or to United States, they do not understand English. Like me, I was not able to understand and speak as I'm doing today. It was hard for me to worship and sing and praise in English. But at that time, when the Haitian people start coming to my house, they feel free as birds. They can sing loud. We sing very loud. We praise. We dance. And they were happy to get together to start worship. And then this is how Christian Evangelical Church of Faith was established. We've been on Cape Cod for 11 years, but nobody knows. But God done so many good things through this ministry. We've been helping people from here to Haiti. We travel from here with missionary from Cape Cod go to Haiti. We even start building an orphanage in Haiti. We're supporting kids to go to school. Here on the Cape, there's many families who are just wondering coming to Cape Cod. They, do not, they have nobody. As I was talking to pastor the other day, so we now, a month ago, we had to transform our basement to, 
to a place where people live. We, we went to an hotel to rent the hotel for the service because they don't know where to go. And then our family welcomed them to our house. And then this is why we've been looking around for a place to continue to worship. And somehow God led us to this place. And I met Pastor Rodney. Welcome me like a brother, like you know me before. And then finally I met with the trustee of the committee. And then we share our word, we share our knowledge according to the word of God. And then here are we today, we're willing to come here to worship in this place. I feel blessed and my family blessed. We are so happy to be with you this morning. And then we'll continue to pray and then we ask you your prayer. And then God can do great things with us. This is part of our detail, but hopefully another day we will give you more. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. I'd like to have a prayer for you all. Thank you. Thank you. So if we could come out maybe out front. We'd like to have a prayer time. And I'd like to invite you. We're on a prayer of dedication as they begin this ministry. It was been going on for years, but uh, starting in this new place, and it'll be able to be more fruitful and grow. I invite you, if you just want to lift your hand kind of as a laying on of hands for them as we support them. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this uh, new church that will be meeting here with uh, here in our location. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us to use our um, facility, our building, and our property to uh, be a blessing to this community and to the Haitian people who are coming to Cape Cod. So we pray for Pastor Lewis and his family and the other members of their congregation. We pray that you would strengthen them. We pray that you would equip them to to reach families and to provide for the needs that they have as they come to this uh, new place, uh, maybe not with a place to, to live or, or knowing no one uh, with uh, language barriers. So we ask your blessing upon them as they reach and provide for the care and needs of the people coming to Cape Cod. We pray that you would strengthen them with the resources they need, uh, with people, with uh, the finances and, and resources and that you would uh, show us as a Northside congregation how we can uh, not just provide a space for them, but to support them through our prayers. In other ways, you may be leading us to provide um, uh, resources and help and strength and, and work with them to reach uh, all the people here on Cape Cod with your love and in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. It's okay. Nice to meet you. Bless you. If you're able, I invite you to stand and we'll sing together Marching to Zion, number 733. Sweets, 
Before we reach the heavenly fields, before we reach the heavenly fields, or walk the golden streets, or walk the golden streets. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Imagine with me, a chicken and a pig are walking down the sidewalk of Dennis, and they're walking by, we have a sidewalk out front, they notice the sign in front of the church um, says, has the sermon message for the Sunday sermon, it says, helping the poor, and the pig and chicken continue walking along, and the chicken has a great idea, chicken says, brother pig, why don't we join in in helping the poor, why don't we give a nice breakfast for all the poor, a breakfast of ham and eggs. Pig thought for a moment, says that might be okay for you. For you, it means just a contribution. But for me, it's a total commitment. What is a total commitment? Total commitment for that pig to provide that breakfast meant giving his life. I read an article in high, uh, about a high school baseball coach who was reflecting on his job as a coach, and he said, I gave the kids and the game my all. I always acted with their best interest in mind. Football season started this weekend. College football kicked off. My alma mater played last night and won their game, so very happy about that today. The Patriots begin next Sunday. And we're going to be expecting those players and those coaches to commit, to give a full commitment, a total commitment, if they're to have a successful season this year. What does it mean for you and your activities, to your spouse, to your children, to your, uh, someone you may be providing care for, in your job, in your studies if you're a student, to the church, to other organizations you're a part of? What does it mean? in those areas, for you to be or to give a total commitment. Jesus spoke of the necessity of a total commitment. He said to his disciples, you must take up your cross and follow me. Here's what total commitment ended up meaning for Jesus' closest friends and disciples. Andrew died on a cross. Simon was crucified. Bartholomew was skinned alive. James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded. The other James, the son of Alphaeus, was beaten to death. Thomas was run through with a spear. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. Matthew was slain with a sword. Peter was crucified upside down. Thaddeus was shot to death with arrows. And Philip was hanged. Only John did not die a martyr's death, but he was exiled to die on a prison, in a prison colony on a small island, isolated island in the Mediterranean. All of these disciples of Jesus suffered this fate because of their love and their commitment to Jesus. The demands Jesus makes upon those who would follow him are not light. They're extreme demands. Following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. It's not for just a casual observer. It's more than just joining together with another a group of folks on Sunday morning to sing together, to hear his word for an hour. It's a deep hungering for God. It shakes our foundations. It turns over our priorities. For some people in, in, around the world, it can lead to persecution and death. 
Probably not for us here in the U.S., but in some parts of the world, that's something they have to think about. If you're a Christian, you've thought, have you thought about the demands Jesus has called you to make? Are those demands difficult or hard for you to consider? We learn in today's scripture that a large crowd was traveling with Jesus. And in that crowd, people were probably following for, for a multitude of reasons. Some were probably following him because they had seen the, Jesus feed the 5,000 and they were wanting to be fed in that miraculous kind of way. Others had seen him provide miraculous healings of people and they wanted to be able to approach him and be healed themselves. Others saw how he confronted and challenged the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and they wanted to be part of that excitement of a revolution that was maybe starting. But how many were following Jesus because they were truly committed to his teachings? Why do you follow Jesus? What is your motive? Aware that there are many different motives of the different ones in the crowd, Jesus tells them what is involved in a true commitment. If you're committed to following Jesus, he says, we must, or we must first establish priorities. Too often we allow things to get in the way of those things that are important to us, of that highest priority that we have in our lives. Our hobbies interfere with time we would spend, normally spend with children. Jobs take precedence over our marriages and time with our spouses. Television displaces conversations over dinner. We have the best of intentions and the priorities we know we need to be involved in that help provide or are vital for a good and fruitful life. But we don't carry out those priorities each day on a regular basis. Someone calculated what it's like to spend our 70-year lifespan, how that breaks down uh, a typical lifespan. So if you lived... Many of you are over 70, I'm guessing. A few of you are over, two or three of you are over 70 that you've told me. So if you've lived a normal life for that 70 years, and those of us who are hoping to get to 70, here's how you, your life would break down. You had spent 23 years sleeping. You had spent 16 years at work. You'd watch TV for eight years. You would eat for six years. You would travel for six years. You would spend four and a half years in leisure playing golf or tennis or other activities. You would be sick for four years. You would spend two years just getting dressed. And your time here at church or religious practice would be for half a year. When we put it in these terms, we see how short, small of a priority spiritual matters are in our typical lives. Jesus has high expectations of his followers. He said, you cannot be my disciple without giving up everything you own. Possessions cannot stand between us and God. Jesus went so far as to say, and this sounds a little harsh and extreme, but Jesus said, anyone who comes to me and does not hate his own mother and father, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, cannot be my disciple. Would you think about that? I can't, I can't love Shelley or Mason or Cashman or Bren or you and your spouse or family members. I don't think Jesus is literally saying, go hate your wife or hate your husband or hate your children. But Jesus has taken something that's precious and dear to us and important to us. And Jesus said, as great as that is and as uh, committed as you are to those members of your family, you have to love and be more committed to me. And uh, if we think about it, if we follow Jesus' teachings, if we look at what Jesus says and how he teaches us to live, then if we are loving Jesus even more, then we're going to love those members of our family. We're going to love the others, our, our other priorities. We're going to be more committed to even those things because of our deep commitment to Jesus. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So our work, any fear we might have, our recreation, our family, nothing can stand between us and the call to discipleship. Jesus demands our all. You may be thinking all of this sounds so unreasonable, but if you think about other priorities you have in your life, the things that are important to you, you have to make choices. 
You can only have one, prior, one top priority. You can't have three, four, five top priorities and give equal time to all. One is going to be more important, and you have to make choices and sacrifices in those other areas if you're going to be committed to that which is most important. Jesus comes to us and makes demands. He says, take up your cross and follow me. So to follow Jesus, we first need to establish some priorities. And second, we must count the cost of what it means to follow. Jesus offers this illustration in the text. He said, suppose one of you wants to build a tower or building, and before you build it, what are you going to do first? You're going to first sit down, you're going to estimate what it costs to build that building before you actually build the building. You don't, aren't going to just jump right in and lay the foundation and get started in the work and then find out you've run out of money. Then you have to stop midway through the project and abandon it. And then you become the laughingstock of the community for that. When Jesus told this story, he was on his way to Jerusalem. All around him, the crowds followed, thinking they were going to overthrow Rome and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. But Jesus knew this journey was not going to lead to a victorious king and overthrow, but it was rather going to lead to death on a cross. What a contrast. Many in the crowd followed Jesus for shallow reasons, and then they started to fall away as they started to experience opposition and some persecution. It's important we sit down and we take an account of why it is we follow Christ. Do we have the stamina to go the distance? even if that finish line requires our all. Jesus wanted the crowd to ask the question, and he, he wants us to ask the question. If I say I want to follow Christ, have I considered what Jesus is asking of me? So to follow Christ, we establish our priorities, we count the cost, and we must be willing to pay the price. In no uncertain terms, Jesus told the crowd, any of you who is not willing to give up everything cannot be my disciple. Jesus spells out the extremely high cost of discipleship. It will cost all you have. If you should choose to follow Jesus, there's no part of your life that's immune. The call of Jesus impacts your time, your energy, your relationships, your talents, your money and your other resources, your vocation your mind, and your willpower. Abraham gave up his son. Moses gave up the life in Pharaoh's court, a prestigious life. Peter gave up his fishing business. Matthew gave up the lucrative salary of a tax collector. And Paul gave up the role as a religious leader. You may not be called to leave your jobs, to leave your family, or to leave your home, but there's something. Jesus is calling you that you might be struggling with to give up. Is is there something Jesus is calling you to leave behind so that you can follow him wholly and completely? I receive a daily email each week by um, called the Denison Forum. It's by a professor, Dr. Jim Denison. He takes in this email, he takes a a current event in the news and, and looks at it from a biblical perspective. And one of the ones uh, that came out this past week was about President Biden's decision to forgive student loans. I'm not going to go into all the details of that. We know uh, and have read the papers about that. But I would like to share the biblical perspective he offers on this topic. He says, if you're like most of us, my guess is you are processing this debate through the prism of your personal experience. If you're a supporter of the president, you probably support his decision. If you're critical of the president, you probably don't like his decision. If your student loans have just gotten canceled, you're probably very grateful. If you paid back your student loans, you're probably angry because others won't have to pay theirs back. It's human nature to measure the world through our personal experience. After all, you have no eyes through which to see the world but your own. But we must beware. Our fallen condition prompts us to be our own God. A desire empowered by specific and technological advances that enable us to bend the world to our will more so than ever before. Paradoxically, this quest for self-advancement comes at the detriment of the self. 
In his book, Man's Search for Ultimate Meaning, psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl observed, man is originally characterized by his search for meaning rather than his search for himself. The more he forgets himself, giving himself to a cause or another person, the more human he is. The more he's immersed and absorbed in something or someone other than himself, the more he becomes himself. Jesus took this theme further. He said, whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Loses translates a Greek word that means to destroy utterly or to bring to ruin. If we obliterate our life for Jesus, we will find it, guaranteed, he writes. And only then, the Bible repeatedly calls us to submit our lives completely to God with the promise that God will give us in return a life we could never achieve or experience by ourselves. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God, and God will make straight your path. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for, for me. He says, in the normal Christian life, Chinese theologian Watchman Nee wrote, a day must come in our lives as definite as the day of our conversion when we give up all right to ourselves and submit to the absolute lordship of Jesus Christ. So he asks, has this day come for you? And here's one way to know. Nee asked, is there anything God is asking you that you are withholding from him? Is there any point of contention between you and God? Then he added, not till every controversy is settled and the Holy Spirit is given full sway can he reproduce the life of Christ in the heart of any believer. So can the Holy Spirit reproduce the life of Jesus in your heart today? Why are we talking about being a totally committed disciple of Jesus? Why is that important? In verses 34 and 35, which are just after the ones that Jim stopped reading from, it says, salt is good, but if salt loses its flavor, how will it become salty again? It has no value, neither for the soil or for the manure pile. People people throw it away. Whoever has ears to hear should pay attention. In Matthew 5.13, Jesus calls each of us to be salt of the earth. What is salt good for? We put salt on our food to make it taste better. Salt is used more so in the olden days than now, but used to preserve food and make it last longer. Salt is used to heal wounds. Salt makes us thirsty. Our total commitment, to being totally committed to Christ, is how we remain salt, how we remain useful salt of the earth that Christ calls us to be. And it's not just for our benefit, but it's for the benefit of others. If we remain totally committed to Christ, then we can be that salt that helps bring healing to someone else, that makes others thirsty for Christ, that helps um, make others want to know more about Jesus or, or the life that Jesus offers. When we commit ourselves fully to Christ, We continue to serve as that salt and help other people experience all that Jesus wants them to experience in life. As fully committed Christians, we are equipped to share the love of Christ with every person we meet on Cape Cod and to be salt that leads people to want to um, experience Christ in their lives even more. So let us seek to be fully committed, commit ourselves fully to Christ, that we might be the salt that helps transform the world for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Antonio is going to come, and Gary and Antonio are going to lead us in a communion anthem as we prepare to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion this morning.
body that's broken for you. Come to this feast of love. Here is the blood that I shed for you. Come to this feast of love. Here is the life that I lived for you. Come share the feast of love. Here is the life that I gave for you. Come share this feast of love. Come, come, come in prayer. Bring your pain, bring your care. Uh, behind me, it's not uh, in your bulletin. This or in the hand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. We praise you for all who labor for the common good, for those whose service is unappreciated. We thank you for children whose play is the work of learning to live in the world. We thank you for disciples who are obedient to the promptings of your spirit in all their relationships. We thank you for your yearning mercy that waits for us to make all our hours and days participation in your healing and blessing of the earth and all people. You made us in your image, set us in a lush garden of, as caretakers. When we chose to have it all to ourselves, you turned our freedom to the toil for survival. When we cried out in our misery, you delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God. By the prophets, you called us to return to you, to delight in good food without price. You confronted us with the waste of laboring apart from you. You asked us, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, 
heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Anoint with your spirit his food to do your will and to complete it. He took the common things of daily life. He blessed them and broke and shared them so that all were satisfied. He told those who followed him, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. He confronted the powers of greed and evil at the cost of his life. But you triumphed over death. You placed him at your right hand to intercede for his disciples until the feast of eternal life. By water and the Spirit, he calls us to continue his work until we and all people feast at his heavenly banquet. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves to to live daily as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and the juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, In your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. With the confidence of God's children, shall we pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have before us the gifts of God that Jesus has prepared through his sacrifice of love, where he gave his all, his total commitment to each and every one of us. So you're all invited to come and receive these gifts of Christ's love that's offered to us. So whether you're an adult or child, a member of this congregation or not, these gifts have been prepared for you. Uh, so the gifts, we've got um, just regular pieces of bread you'll be given, and you can and small cups of grape juice, and you can receive those. Uh, and I didn't put the baskets out, so just hang on to your cups, and you can toss them as you go into the fellowship hall after the service. Uh, for our coffee fellowship. If anyone has a gluten allergy, we do have gluten-free bread. Just let me know when you come forward, and I'll have that available for you. So Eileen, would you come and assist me?
Shall we pray? Gracious Lord, we thank you for this sacrament where we celebrate and recognize the ways you've given yourself for us as you gave your life, your all for us. Lord, may we follow your lead. May we seek to give ourselves for the sake of others, that others might be drawn to you to experience the new life, the whole life, the forgiveness, the blessings of life that you seek to offer to all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand together and we'll sing, O Jesus, I Have Promised, number 396. Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side. Wander from the Thou wilt be my guide. Oh, let me feel thee near me. The world is ever near. I see the sights that dazzle, the tempting sounds I hear. My foes are ever near me, around me and with but Jesus, draw thou nearer and shield my soul from sin. Oh, let me hear these words. Will I follow thee that when thou art in glory there shall thy servant be. And Thank you all for joining us this morning. Those who joined us online, we are we're glad to have you with us as well. Hope you all have a wonderful week. Pastor Lewis, I hope your family and church members can join us in the fellowship hall. I know our congregation would love to get to meet you. And you're all invited to, for coffee and refreshments in the fellowship hall immediately after our service. Don't forget next week we'll be outdoors. Bring where your north side church, uh, casual time. Great service next week. So let us offer God's blessings to one another as we sing our Northside benediction. May the love of Northside travel everywhere you go. Peace around your soul and spirit. Let your goodness show. Live your life in his word. Make a difference now. Fill your week with acts of kindness till we meet again. Amen.